Yeah, back again. All right. So you read through the textbook um, and it went through um, a couple of what it called attention disorders. Uh, and so it talked about visual neglect again. Again, once again, I wasn't, I wasn't aware the textbook was going to talk about it. So I had talked about it earlier, but it's good. I want to weave it in now. Um, but it also got into ADHD and, and really connected with this notion that we sometimes call sustained attention or the attention span. So as we consider attention and the role it's playing in the context of consciousness, I wanted to speak to that too and, and kind of add a little bit to what the textbook is uh, presenting there. Okay, so let's jump in. And let's jump in first of all with this uh, quick discussion of visual neglect and, and kind of connecting some of what I told you earlier with what the textbook then told you with that framework I've been using all the way through here. So first of all, just to remind you, visual neglect is this kind of um, odd um, uh, set of behaviors that occur when somebody has damage uh, to the uh, to their parietal lobe, not the primary cortex, but the, the association cortex of the parietal lobe. And they, they show this issue. Now there's a lot we don't understand about visual neglect. So first of all, it's almost always the left side of space that gets neglected. It's, this isn't one of the cases that if it's your right parietal, one thing happens, and if it's your left parietal, something else happens. Uh, if your right parietal, this happens, and that's all we see. We don't see a, a sort of reflected um, version of this. And so just to remind you of what we see with these patients, here's two different examples that I took from the textbook, but you could give them some pictures and you could say, hey, can you please copy these pictures? And what you see when they do is they have this real bias to copy the right side of the pictures, but to leave the left side of the pictures um, kind of out. Uh, and this also happens when you just ask them. And in this case, you could say, hey, can you draw a face for me? Or can you draw the face of a clock for me? And so now they're not copying, they're not looking at the world, they're just pulling this out of their memory and they're drawing. But they still seem to be what we call neglecting the left side of space. Uh, and, and it's not that they can't see it. Uh, it. It's there, but it's kind of like attention just isn't pulled there. Um, the, it, their mind does not go to the left side of things very much. And, and if attention doesn't go there, consciousness doesn't go there. And so again, there's weird things like if you give them a plate of food, they will eat all the food on the right and put their fork and knife down like they're done. But if you spin the plate so that the leftover food is now on the right, it's like, oh, they see it and they eat it. Um, wow, mm, strange, right? And so this is a disorder of attention, uh, we think. Just, just getting attention over to the left side of the space seems to be a problem. Uh, the textbook then went on to talk about something um, that, I, that I didn't even know of. Uh, I thought was very cool and I, and I think it really fits with the story we're building up and so I wanted to stress that. And so they talked about this example. They said, if you showed people these two houses, now I have one on the left and one on the right, but that doesn't mean anything. Imagine they just saw this house. Here's house number one, you show it to them, okay? And here's house number two, you show it to them. Um, you can ask them, are those houses different? And quite often they will say no, because they're different on the left side of space, right? This one's on fire. And again, they usually don't attend to that side of the space. They attend to the right side of space over here. And on the right side of the space, these houses are the same. And so quite often a patient will say, house number one and two are the same then? And they'll say, yep, house number one and two are the same. But if you then say, which one would you rather live in? They'll say, hmm, house number one. And if you say why, they will say things like, just seems a little sturdier, seems a little safer. I don't know. Um, and so we're almost back to the split brain stuff and, and a number of other things where people obviously have information in their mind. This is perception without awareness again. So somehow the fact that this one's on fire is into their unconscious mind. It's not reaching their conscious mind because they're not attending to it. So when you ask the conscious mind to pick, it picks one and it is informed by the unconscious. So the unconscious would, would push conscious processes to pick the one on the left, but they don't know why. Um, they just pick one. And when you now push them to provide an explanation of the one they picked, um, they will give you one. They will sort of try to make sense of it to themselves. And in fact, 
This is one of the things people say consciousness does. It tries to make sense of our behavior and describe it in some story that we can relate to ourselves and relate to other people. Uh, as you'll see in, in, in one situation, uh, there's a psychologist that says that's all consciousness does is just tell stories, make sense of our behavior and tell these little stories to make it make sense. Um, but we will see that quite often. And we saw it in the split brain, right? That, that, that when you, when the left, eh, when the right side of the brain was allowed to, to choose some object and you ask the left side, why remember the left side is where the speech is, the left would come up with a reason. Uh, and sometimes that reason would be in the ballpark. It's kind of like it knows a little bit about what information is in the unconscious. Um, and so it can get sort of in the ballpark of, of why, but you can tell it really doesn't know. Like in this case, they won't say because it's on fire. They will say something maybe about safety or structure or whatever, uh, but they won't really nail it down. So again, all of this fits with, with this notion, right? Where the left side of space in the case of that, that house is getting into the unconscious mind and the unconscious mind is seeing that, hey, um, one house is on fire and the other isn't. Uh, the conscious mind doesn't see this because it's only looking at the right and they look the same. And so when the conscious mind is asked to, um, you know, which one it wants, it, it doesn't have a preference. They're both the same. But if you really push it, well, the unconscious mind can have an influence on our conscious experience. So we can see one house is safer, even though they look exactly the same. This unconscious influence makes one of them look a little safer. And if we have to pick, we pick that one. Um, and if we have to come up with a reason, we kind of maybe have a sense of safeness in our head. So we build some story over it looking more structured or something. Okay, so these interesting rich interactions between the information we perceive without awareness and the information we perceive with awareness. So I just thought that was a cool other example. Okay, so now let's take it the next step. Where does ADHD fit in? Uh, attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Um, as implied, um, people who have ADHD, and, and that probably includes a number of you who were di diagnosed at some point with ADHD, it's pretty prevalent. Um, they tend to show these two different issues that are kind of both incorporated in that, in that term. Uh, attention deficit, they have trouble sustaining attention. We're going to come to this in a moment. They have attentional issues, focusing, concentrating, staying on task um, is a problem for them. And, and they, they get distracted very easily and pulled in other directions. Heck, we all do, um, but this is you know a little more extreme. And hyperactivity disorder, um, not only do they sort of have trouble staying on task, but part of that is because they feel this need to do something else. Uh, and so they're hyperactive, they need a little bit of action. Uh, and so to, when, when a lot of these children come to school where you are asked to pay attention to a not that interesting teacher sometimes, <laughs> quietly, sit there quietly at your desk, pay attention and don't start doing other things, sit quietly um, and keep your attention on me and keep thinking about what we're all thinking about together. Um, people who have ADHD find this a very, very challenging context. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, and, and so what I wanna kind of connect with, first of all, I'm not gonna talk too much about the HD part, although we can, we can bring that in. I wanna talk about the AD attention deficit. Because I think there's another, again, I, I worry in chapters like this that it's very important to see how these different terms all connect. And I think this diagram is helping us connect um, some of these. And so with attention deficit disorder, uh, I mentioned that, you know, you you can direct your attention towards certain things, but the world can also pull your attention away, right? And we're all potentially susceptible to that. And when we are trying to focus, we're trying to keep that distraction out. And, and we're really kind of using that active attention and saying, no, 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 I want to focus on this. It's hard. It's hard for any of us. In fact, um, this is one of the, the interesting phenomena. I got to tell you a little bit of a story and we'll come back to sustained attention. In the let me say it this way, the chapter that the research I've been mostly telling you about in this chapter has been research um, mostly gathered in the 1980s, 1990s, even even maybe 
2000s, but mostly 80s and 90s, during something we call the cognitive revolution, when we started studying the mind again. Before the cognitive revolution, something called behaviorism reigned. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next chapter, actually. Next chapter. I shouldn't push it. I should go that way. Uh, behaviorism. Um, and behaviorism was all about just studying behavior and not studying the mind and so there was a very scientific thing as we'll talk about and and they thought you could study the environment that some type some organism is put in and then you can look at how they behave as a function of changes to their environment but that's it because those are the things we can see so it was psychology's attempt to be one of those hard sciences let's stick to objective data um, and let's not talk about things like memory and attention and consciousness so there'll be a period of time when psychologists just did not talk Talk about these concepts but then in the 1960s and 70s and 80s that all blew loose and it blew loose partly because of this issue um, this was a time when there was a lot of um, wars going on post-world war ii and then into vietnam and suddenly the military became interested in the mind specifically they had this thing called radar right and you guys have seen this this arm sweeps across and it shows little blips that correspond to things that are out there. So if you're on a ship, these might correspond to other ships uh, relative to you. It may correspond to aircraft or missiles coming in. And it, it can go out there pretty far. And so this is the ship's early warning system, right? But it required a human being to sit here and watch this arm go around and be aware if a new blip emerged. Right? And there's always a bunch of blips on the screen, but the idea is if something new suddenly appears, and especially if it's coming towards us in any way, shape, or form, we want you to catch that as quick as possible and say, oh, we got an inbound airplane coming at us right now. The problem is you'd sit there for hours staring at this thing and nothing would happen. Nothing new would happen. It would be the same blips over and over again. And what they found is people just couldn't do this. They just could not sustain their attention on such a boring task. And so the military started funding uh, research on what this was. Uh, how can we enhance sustained attention? Because so many lives depended on this. Now, of course, today we would just have some AI system that you know, acknowledged the new blip and suddenly warned everybody about it. But here it was really about the human detecting that. Uh, and, and so suddenly people were interested in, in that. And that was one of the things that sort of started to feed the cognitive revolution. Um, it, it, it was something that behaviorism could not speak to. Uh, and, and we really had to think about attention itself and how it worked. Uh, and so that sort of opened the door a little bit to us coming back and restudying the mind. You're going to get the rest of this story more, but I just wanted to pre view um, the importance of, of things like radar. But they really did come to this, this notion of here is another aspect of attention. So we talked about you can't attend to a bunch of things at once, so you have to select something. Sometimes those things select themselves. They pull your attention towards them. Sometimes you um, actively direct your attention somewhere. But now we're going to talk about the next part. Let's say you've actively directed your attention somewhere. Can you keep it there? How long can you keep it there? And how long can it become a channel of information processing where you're thinking deeply about what you're, what you're seeing? Okay, and this is something you've heard of a lot, uh, I think, in the media. Um, there's this notion that young people nowadays have a much shorter attention span than we old people did. Um, first of all, we don't evolve and our brain doesn't evolve generation to generation that much. Uh, and so it would be very unlikely that something as critical as our attention span would change that quickly from a generation to another. Um, but in a sense it has, because what's really happened is the world has become much more full of distraction. Uh, and that's what this really shows in this table here, uh, is, is the idea that we live in a world where we now carry around a distraction device with us everywhere we go. And it's constantly sending us notifications to pay attention to this, pay attention to that. And those are like sudden onsets, right? They are the passive attention system and they pull your attention to whatever. There's also reward systems at play that make this really powerful. 
talk about those next lecture. Um, and, and so what it is, is we live in a world that has more distractions and therefore it is harder to focus our attention on one thing, not because we've lost our ability to focus our attention, but because we have a whole lot more things trying to pull it away than we used to. There's more competition to some to some level. Uh, and so, you know, here's here's how I like to make that point. And this this website kind of talks about um, this, too. It's always kind of funny when you get to hear uh, <laughs> stuff like this. Um, there are statistics, too, that the average span is down from 12 seconds in the year 2000. That you can only focus on something for 12 seconds before getting pulled away. Um, that is now less than the nine second attention span of your average goldfish. So first of all, as this article suggests, nobody knows how long a goldfish can sustain their attention and nobody suggests that fish are any better or worse at it than we are. So comparing to a goldfish is silly to begin with. Uh, but as they also say, when you try to figure out where these numbers come from, they're bull crap. Um, the, the, there is the, there is no good measure and we don't really measure it that way because we don't think of it that way. Psychologists, we think of attention and and sustained attention related to that thing we've been calling engagement. So I'm going to make that transition. But let's start here. Did you watch Lord Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Rings, or any of the Lord of the Rings movies? Or have you watched any movie? Could you watch a movie if you had a 12-second attention span? If, if that's all you could pay attention? I mean, I've... There are times when me or my wife fall asleep after 12 seconds into a movie. So maybe there are times when that when that happens. But, you know, when when it's a great movie, um, you we can the Fellowship of the Rings is 208 minutes, 208 minutes. That's three hours and <laughs> we should be able to do this management better. Three hours and 28 minutes, almost three and a half hours. Forget 12 seconds. You can sustain your attention for three and a half hours. What's the difference? Why in some situations is it really hard to sustain your attention? And in other situations, you can, you can pay a lot of attention. Well, there's, there's sort of two things we can talk about here. One is you. Sorry for pointing at you. It's not polite, but it's pointing at me too. So hey, you. So characteristics of you. So if you find some content interesting, then you're going to be able to sustain your attention on it a whole lot more. So for example, you know, you and I could sit down and we could watch videos about how to set up a guitar, how to maintain an electric guitar. You would probably find those boring as heck and, and would stop listening in no time. Whereas I would think, oh, I could use this information. There's stuff here I want to know uh, because I want to set up some guitars. And therefore for me, it's much easier for me to sustain my attention. So sometimes it's attributes of ourselves um, that, that are relevant. Often it's attributes of the thing we are experiencing. Um, you notice things like, by the way, this. What the heck is with this? Why do we have animations in PowerPoints? Um, they provide what we call pattern interrupts something new onsets you guys know about this now and every time there's a new onset it kind of pulls your attention back to what we're talking about that's what i'm trying to do keep your attention on these lectures i'm trying to do it by being a little wacky every now and then being animated uh, but also incorporating images a lot in my slides rather than words um, and trying to have some animation happening on a regular basis to keep pulling you back um, and, and occasionally changing things up a little now and then pattern interrupts and in fact uh, well we'll get back to the pattern interrupts but the real story here now is if if this if what you're experiencing has the attributes to pull you towards it and if you are interested in what this is that's happening in front of you that's the best of both worlds when when your interests um, connect with something that's being delivered to you in an engaging way okay so when that happens that's when we really have engagement, okay? Now, you have this task um, that, we're, that I will be unveiling more at the end of this week, by the way, your work integrated learning um, project. And one of the areas that some of you are working on is the area of engagement. Um, how can so many students you know, find e-learning boring? 
um, they get pulled by their social media one way or another, what can we do to enhance the engagement, to make it easier for students to focus on the information? Now, you know, I've already kind of given you some sense of some of the things I do to try to keep you guys engaged as we go through, but let's kind of talk about this more generally. You know that there's this, that, that I'm playing with this different way of doing things now. In the traditional lecture, it involved a bunch of students and somebody just standing up and talking in front of them. However, it had some advantages, right? It's, it's real. <laughs> That person is a real human being. They can look you in the eye as they're talking. They can walk amongst you. Um, and, and as they do that, when you're in a, in a world with a speaker who's doing that, that can be very engaging, especially if they're a very good speaker. Um, and, and it could be almost like Lord of the Rings, that if they're a good speaker and if it's a good topic and if they're presenting this topic in an organized way and maybe shaking things up now and then, showing a YouTube video, some pattern interrupts, then a, a great lecture can be a great lecture. And you can have an easy time listening for an hour. If we take that same lecture and we put it online, well, now that human being isn't walking among you. Now they are not staring you in the eyes. They, they are, you know, just talking like I am just talking. Uh, and it can feel, if it's done right, it can still feel like you're right across, you know, that's what I kind of shoot for, is I want you to feel like you're right across the table from me and we're having a chat. Um, but um, it's not the same. You know, the, the real-time humanness of it isn't there. And quite often, if we give you an hour lecture to watch in that way, online, um, with all these distractions available to you, you're gonna find it a challenge. Um, and so one of the things I'm trying to do to enhance engagement in this course is use these smaller little videos that are embedded directly within the textbook. Uh, and the hope is by talking for you know, 15, 20, 25 minutes instead of an hour, an hour and a half, two hours like some lectures do, uh, that you'll be able to sustain your attention longer, especially if you see the relevance. So if I connect it back to the textbook that you just read, so you see how what I'm saying adds um, or clarifies or connects with, then that's a powerful thing to do. So this is you know one example, again, when we talk about applied research. Uh, transitional research, you know, trying to take information we've learned from the lab, say about how attention works, and then move that into the real world in a context like learning and say, how can we leverage the scientific knowledge to create a better learning experience? Um, you know, that's that's what this, this project will be all about, the work integrated learning piece. And when it comes to engagement, uh, if that's your chosen topic, then this attention stuff you're learning about is very relevant to that, especially sustained attention. Okay, excellent. That's it for that lecture. Uh, this lecture, that, this, whatever. Um, this is cool. I'm enjoying this quite a bit. I think this is a cool new way to do things. Uh, I will see you at the next lecture. I think we're going to talk about sleep. Opposite engagement. See you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>